What is a vector? So vectors in their most simple uh, form are just a list of numbers. And so there's many different types of vectors. Uh, there's two primary types uh, when we talk about uh, vector search. So one is dense vectors. So these are vectors uh, that typically have a float value. And then uh, there are sparse vectors, which are vectors uh, that may have a lot of zeros. Um, and so these are typically binary vectors. Why do I actually need a vector database to work with vectors? Like, why can't I just, you know, put my vectors in, you know, MongoDB or, or you know, some sort of traditional database? Like The reason why you would use a vector database like that's purposely built is just because uh, it's built to be able to have the architecture that will let you scale it up. If you could invest in one company that's not the company you work for, who would it be? Me hugging face. Hugging face, all right. Anything else you'd like to share? If you're interested in doing hackathons and you're in Seattle, hit me up. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Software Huddle. My guest today is Eugene Tang from Zillas, one of the big players in the vector database market. This is the first episode in a series of episodes I'm doing on vectors and vector databases. Eugen and I start with the basics, you know, what is a vector? What are vector embeddings? How does vector search work? And why the heck do I even need a vector database? You know, RAG models for customizing LLMs is where vector databases are getting a lot of their use. On the surface, it seems pretty simple, but in reality, there's a lot of tinkering that goes into taking RAG to production. Eugen explains some of the tripwires that you might run into and how to think through those problems. I think you're going to really enjoy this one and hopefully the series. And if you do, please leave us a positive rating or review, subscribe to the show, and feel free to hit me and Alex up on Twitter or LinkedIn. All right, let's get you over to the episode. Eugene, welcome to Software Huddle. Thanks, Sean. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. So we're hoping to do a whole series of episodes focused on vector databases, vector search right now. It's basically all about vectors. So I'm glad that we're you know, kicking off our vector journey with you. But before we dive too deep into vectors, let's start with you. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, yeah, so my name is Eugene Tang. I am a developer advocate at Zillis. Uh, Zillis is a vector database company. Um, prior to this, I worked at uh, IBM, Amazon, uh, and published some papers uh, to like uh, IEEE Big Data. Awesome. And then were you at all like you know sort of knowledgeable about vector databases and vectors before joining Zillas, or was this something that was uh, sort of a completely new frontier for you? Um, I had never heard of vector databases. I had heard of like uh, feature stores um, and uh, that kind of like uh, uh, data, data store. Um, but I have a background in machine learning. So vectors were very uh, familiar to me. I was like, ah, yes, okay, I know what these are. And after my first like couple conversations during the interview process, I was like, oh, okay, I understand like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I think that's a good place to start. Like, let's start with the basics around a vector. Like, what is a vector and what are vector embeddings and why do you need any of this for machine learning and AI? Yeah, yeah. So vectors in their most simple uh, form are just a list of numbers. That's really like, all you need to know about vectors is list of numbers. And so there's many different types of vectors, right? So uh, there's two primary types that we think about uh, when we talk about uh, vector search. So one is dense vectors. So these are vectors uh, that typically have a float value. Um, you know, these are basically real numbers. And then uh, there are sparse vectors, which are vectors uh, that may have a lot of zeros. Um, and so these are typically binary vectors. Uh, these are typically just zeros and ones. Um, examples of algorithms that produce the sparse vectors include uh, TF-IDF, which is a very popular natural language processing uh, kind of uh, uh, algorithm, um, Splade, and uh, BM25. Um, and then the dense vectors are produced from machine learning models, actually. So what the dense vectors represent the semantic meaning of some type of input. And so the way that you get this is you have your input and you feed it into a model that has been trained on that type of input. And at the end, instead of having the model do some sort of prediction or uh, classification or something, you cut off the last layer and you just take the output from the second to last layer and that's your vector embedding. And that uh, contains all of what the model has learned 
about the input um, in the form of numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you mentioned uh, TF IDF, so term frequency inverse document frequency, which is something that I you know used back in my ML days, uh, which is quite some time ago. Is that actually still you know use widely used in a popular method? Um, not not really. Um, at least like I I don't really hear about it used a lot, but it is like one way that you can get like these like sparse uh, vectors, right? Because then you can see like oh like how how often is this like popping up compared to like other words and how many documents there are. Yeah, absolutely. You get uh, basically like a, a term that doesn't, you know, come across in very many documents. You're you're going to end up with a lot of this very long vectors with not necessarily a lot of numbers. Yes. And then in terms of embeddings, like how do they actually preserve semantic information and about the data and like its relationship to other, you know, similar types of inputs? Yeah. Um, so the embedding... So it works kind of like this. So you have a machine learning model, right? And from the beginning, your machine learning model is just a bunch of random weights. And as you train it, it starts to learn the patterns of the input data. And then uh, that, um, the vector, I guess, the output of that second to last layer creates a, a high dimensional latent space that learns what the relative patterns in the data that you've given it look like. So for example, uh, if we talk about image data, maybe you're feeding it a bunch of pictures of different cats and dogs and um, I don't know, like turtles or something, right? Like, uh, and it's like learning that, oh, there's these like animals there. And um, so that is kind of just how it preserves it. It's just like this output knows that there's this type of animal there. And that's how it's encoded into this, um, this machine learning model, and then that's how we can decode it, basically. And then, how does vector search work when you ha once you've essentially created these representations of these, you know, real world objects? And how is that different than maybe conventional search? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, conventional search that we have right now uh, is like, uh, let's say you're working with databases. Typically, what you're doing is some sort of like, okay, find me all the things that have like this ID value that also have like, these attribute values. Um, and that's like a, basically like you're doing key to key matching. It's very much like you need a direct match. And so vector search is all about finding the nearest neighbors because it is very, you pretty much don't get the same vector embeddings uh, ever. Um, and unless you're embedding the same thing. Um, and so vector search is all about taking these two long lists of numbers and doing that like compute to find like what is the distance between these vectors. And so, so vector databases like Milvis are kind of like built and optimized to be able to effectively uh, and efficiently do this kind of compute. And there's many ways to compare these vectors. So there's uh, L2, which is basically like physical distance in space. It's like if you have a triangle, you can think of like the hypotenuse. Uh, there's cosine. Which, like, uh, if you think of vectors as lines pointing in space, cosine is like the angle between them. Uh, and then there's IP, which, if you think of vectors as lines pointing in space, IP is the projection of one vector onto another. Um, so then you can think of if one of the vectors was a hypotenuse and the other was the leg of a triangle, it's the other leg of that, of that right triangle. Um, so that is, uh, those are like different ways to measure vector distances. Uh, and interestingly, if you transform all of these uh, on normalized vectors, they all give you the same rank order. They basically all come out to the same thing. Uh, so all the nearest, like your top K will pretty much always be the same. Um, and let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So then this is how you can compare vectors. But when you get to like large scales of a large like number of vectors, you're going to want to do this thing called indexing. Um, well, most people who work with SQL databases are probably also familiar with indexing. Um, this is a different type of indexing. So this indexing is creating uh, essentially a map of the vector space that you are using. And there are a few indexes that are very popular. Milvis has 11. I think we can touch on three here. So one would be IVF, which is inverted file index. This is your most intuitive type of 
of vector index. This is essentially doing a clustering, a k-means clustering. Like, let's say, like, oh, I think there's 128 different categories in this vector data. Then I'm going to do 128 different clusters. Um, something kind of like that. And uh, basically, the way that works at query time is you only know the centroids initially, and you find the closest centroids, and then you dig in and you find the closest vectors. And then there's HNSW, so this is Hierarchical Navigable Small Worlds, which is a mouthful. And uh, basically what this is, is this is a graph index, and it's like a layered graph index. Um, so as you insert your vectors, you get a uniform random variable, and that variable will tell you what layer uh, you, it gets inserted up to, um, and you get to determine what that is. And then... Um, the third one uh, that would be uh, interesting to talk about would be SCAN, uh, which is a, well, it's called Scalable Nearest Neighbors, uh, which is kind of an interesting uh, name. But basically, it quantizes the vectors, and you only search the quantized space, and then you search the, um, the actual space. So it's kind of like IBF. And by quantize the vectors, what does that mean? Uh, yes. So, um, so for example... Uh, Let's say you have the set of real numbers from 0 to 10. A quantization of that would be like the integers from 0 to 10. So you would bucket all of 0 to 0 0.5 into 0, and 0 0.5 to 1.5 into 1, and so on and so on. Uh, so quantization is just that kind of like bucketing process. And then that I presumably helps with compute because then you're dealing with integers rather than real numbers? Yes, and it also just makes it so that you have like Oh, yes. Yeah, so there's, there's like the flow 64 to like the int 8 or the int 16 kind of like reduction. Um, but it also just makes it so that you have like a smaller possible vector space to, to initially search. Right. I see. And then going back to the different ways of actually comparing vectors, are there pros and cons to do this, using those different approaches, like, you know, cosine versus a projection or something like that? Like, how, how are those choices made? Are people using a combination of those things? How does all that sort of stuff work? Um, so that would depend on the type of data that you have, the type of data that you are working on. Um, but the way that I kind of think about it is uh, inner product IP, the projection, is actually the most computationally uh, inexpensive. So I kind of just like that because, um, you know, it's nice to have that. Um, but L2 is a very, very popular one. Um, and L2 measures what I would call like semantic like distance in semantic meaning so maybe um uh, it's it's really tough to kind of like give like really good examples of this uh, but cosine measures difference of orientation in semantic meaning and cosine is much more commonly used in natural language processing um it's kind of like like the example that i use in one of my blogs is apples and oranges and how like, oh, you can actually compare like apples and oranges, like and how far apart they are in space. And maybe you can say that apple pie is closer to apples than it is to oranges. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you're trying to achieve and what the context right is. Like if you um, are thinking about purely like fruit, then apples are maybe closer to oranges. But if you're thinking about apple as a pure ingredient, then the composition of a apple pie actually has apple in it, whereas the composition of a orange does not or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes, that's a really good point. All of it also does come back to the actual latent space that your vectors embed, because like, it, you can't compare things that don't exist in that latent space. And then, you know, Bringing this all together back to like a vector database, like why do I actually need a vector database to work with vectors? Like why can't I just, you know, put my vectors in, you know, MongoDB or, or you know, some sort of traditional database? Like, yeah, um, so you can, uh, you can definitely put vectors into any database. Vectors are just a database, a data type. Um, the reason why you would use a vector database like that's purposely built is just because uh, it's built to be able to have the architecture that will let you scale it up, uh, and it'll have like a it has like a purpose built architecture to work with these kinds of vectors. And um, you know, traditional databases aren't 
designed to work like that. Traditional databases are designed to match these key value pairs. Um, and so they would also have to add like extra layers on top of that to even achieve um, anywhere near like the similar type of performance just based on the hardware type that you would uh, regularly need. Okay. And then what are the use cases for a vector database? Like, I, you know, I, I think they become very popular because of, uh, you know, retrieval augmented yes. um, generation or RAG, which we'll, you know, we'll get into. But outside of RAG, like, are there use cases of a vector database? Yes. Uh, so before RAG, so uh, Zillis got started in 2017. And um, prior to RAG, in like the early 2020s, the main thing that we saw people use uh, vector databases for, uh, that we saw people use Milvis for basically, is product recommendations. So products are these um, multi kind of like, like unstructured uh, things, entities, right? So there's like product descriptions and there's like pictures and all these different things. And so people want to be able to uh, to compare, like not just like oh, like what is the product tag, but also like what's in the description, or what are in the images. And so that's kind of the the example of that's like the probably the most prominent example of uh, production usage of vector databases. Um, another one that is kind of interesting is uh, the that uh, people use vector databases for AI drug discovery. Um, and that is a different use case than the others, because unlike, let's say, RAG or product recommendation, you are not using a lot of search uh, all the time. And what those people do actually is they insert a ton of data and then they run search just a few times a year. Um, so these are some of the different use cases and uh, how, like, you know, you can see that these have like different um, the way that people use the database is also kind of different. And so we also think about like, how do you balance this out? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's, let's talk about RAG where I think, you know, it's probably what really brought like the, the idea of the vector database to the, the forefront where, you know, everybody kind of knows in some capacity of the concept of vector database, which I think like two years ago, I think it wouldn't be the case if it was a little bit more niche. So, what is RAG and then kind of like how does the vector database come into play when we're building something like a RAG model? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think vector databases are still surprisingly unknown, even given the popularity of RAG. Uh, at my talks, I often ask people who knows what vector databases are, and still most people are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, maybe I'm overestimating the, the hype cycle for vector databases. I think it's because I think it's because we work in like this AI space, right? And so like the people that we know probably like know this kind of stuff. Um, but RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation, and it is um, exactly what it sounds like. It is when you use data that you retrieve to augment generative AI uh, and what it generates. And so basically the way RAG works is uh, you have some sort of pre-trained LLM, uh, preferably a very powerful one, uh, such as, you know, um, GPT-4 or Mixtral or uh, Llama 2 or something like that. Uh, and then you basically want to interface with the LLM, but the LLM doesn't have access to your data. And so the way that you get your data to feed into the LLM is you put your data, you vectorize your data using an embedding model. And then you put those embeddings into a vector database and you have the vector database kind of sit uh, on top of or in between like the LLM like queries. And so what happens is um, then the user comes, they ask the LLM a question, they interface with the LLM, they say, hey, like, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah query. And then the LLM transforms that query into whatever is needed for some sort of to make something semantically um, uh, similar for it, and then it goes into the vector database and said, hey, tell me about this. And it pulls that data back up and it uses that into the context, into the prompt again, and it and basically says, answer the question now that we know this context. And then it gives you a human readable response. And so that is the RAG process. And then why do we need the RAG process versus just relying on the foundation model? Uh, we basically use RAG and vector databases to inject data. Um, 
you can't really expect large language models or foundation models to um, keep up with all of the data. And you can't, you don't want them to have your private data. And so that's when you would do something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially a lot of times the foundation model is basically fixed at a certain epoch and then you can use rag to augment it so that you can use something that's maybe more real time or, or has happened more recently to get that additional context. And then as well as domain specific stuff so that I might be able to like disambiguate certain acronyms that are, you know, relate to the type of query that I'm putting in or whatever it is that I need to perform. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then how does this compare to something like fine tuning, which is another way of sort of adjusting the foundation model? Yeah. Uh, so fine tuning and rag have two different kind of, um, use cases, I would say. So rag is more for when you just have your data and you want to, uh, like basically force inject your data at generation time. And um, fine tuning is when you take your data and you like train the model some more or train like some piece of the model or some layer of the model or some set of layers of the model or whatever uh, on your new, on your data. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, expect the model has learned a little bit about your data. Uh, so the thing with fine tuning is that unless you are a very large corporation that has access to a lot of GPUs and a lot of money and a lot of time, you are unlikely to be able to um, inject enough factual data via fine tuning to get the factual data responses back that you want. Um, but what it does do is it does allow you to um, kind of inject something uh, like um, a little bit of like context into the into the the foundational model. So some techniques, for example, just fine tune like you know like the last few layers, right? So then you're basically injecting some sort of context into the model, uh, and you can kind of use these together. For example, you can have a model that perhaps acts like talks like you know uh, Taylor Swift and uh, knows you know, everything about machine learning. Okay. And then, so I, th I feel like in principle, when you describe RAG, like it sounds fairly simplistic. Like I, you know, I put in a prompt, I, you know, vectorize it, I run it against my vector database, I pull back related documents, and then I add that as the context and, you know, magic basically happens. But like what, I, I know that it's much more complicated than that. And there's a lot yeah. of like, fiddling to actually get these systems to work so like what are some of the like things that make this difficult like where do what are the problems or landmines that people end up stepping on and have to navigate when they're actually building like a, a rag model for like something that's not just demo where they're actually doing this for something like production yeah um so number one is data pre-processing is pretty important so uh for uh text-based rag um you basically need to ensure that the way that you chunk your text up, that is like, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, decide how many characters you want to have in one chunk. Um, when you chunk your text up, uh, that's very important. It has to maintain context as well as have enough semantic meaning to it to make sense. Um, so that's one thing that's important is like to, chunk size. And then another thing is like chunk overlap. So for example, sometimes you will want your chunks to overlap by some amount in order to retain context between uh, chunks um, or yeah, between chunks. And then uh, another thing to look for is like, if your data is very varied in the length of perhaps context. So for example, if you have something that is like a Q&A, or maybe you have a, you know, a customer service uh, chat transcript, and you're like, oh, well, you know, like the the, the customer is complaining about this, and it's like very very in length, and then the uh, the sales rep is giving this kind of advice or the you know blah blah blah, and so you have something that's very very in length, then you'll want something perhaps like a special character splitter, so something that can look at where uh, look at what the characters are and say like, hey, actually, let's this is one semantically sound chunk and let's cut it off. Um, so that is 
number one. And then number two is getting an embeddings model. So you have to pick the right embeddings model and you probably, uh, when you are putting something into production, you're going to want an embeddings model that is customized because, uh, you know, the, there are generalized ones, but it's very unlikely that that is what you need. Um, it is fine if you're just building a chatbot, I guess, uh, but you're probably going to want it to have some, some context of your data. Uh, so there's embeddings models. And then beyond that, there are the way that you want to save your data or the way that you want to store your data. So metadata, uh, so vector databases uh, can store metadata. Um, so there's two types of, there's two entries that has to go into each entry. So one is ID and the other is the vector embedding. And the rest of it is what we call metadata. So you can store metadata and there's also a couple of uh, interesting techniques that people use for this, including like storing the um, the vector embedding for a sentence, but then actually storing the text for the larger paragraph. So this lets you pull all of the context when you're finding similar vectors. And then people also do the other way around where you store the uh, vector embedding for the entire paragraph and then you just store the sentence so that even when you're pulling um, you know, specific, uh, or sorry, so you can get like specific pieces of text when you're pulling something that has like a, that relates to a larger context. Um, so those are just some kind of like ways or techniques to kind of get started with building this, uh, this kind of rack stuff. And then getting it into production is always hard because, uh, a lot of companies now can't use open AI. So you can't just like drop in an API key. Um, uh, so you gotta like run it on your own. You gotta like get some sort of like foundational model, maybe an open source one and run it on your own hardware. And it, for the essentially the chunking and and figure and and sort of this dance that you have to do around the LM token limits, is that something that a, a vector database like helps you with, or is that something that you just have to use some additional tooling or build something to figure out what that is going to be for the particular problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah, so chunking is uh, a pre-processing step to getting the vector. Um, so Vector databases kind of sit downstream from that. So I would say like first step is like you chunk up your text and then you get the vector and then you put it into a vector database. Uh, so vector databases don't help with that. Um, it's something that you kind of have to like figure out. Uh, so you can use tools to do this, uh, like Langchain and Llama Index uh, uh, all offer ways that you can do this. Um, and then the way at least like current methods that I've seen for checking like how good your chunking is, is really just put it into a basic rag app and like do some observability, use some sort of like tool, like, um, you know, like arise, uh, Phoenix or like true lens, uh, Trera true lens or whatever. Like there are many like tools out there that people, um, people have built to do observability for, uh, rag apps. Yeah. Like once you've actually, uh, create, you've done your chunking, you've created your embeddings, and let's say things are, are working reasonably well, but then as you're actually observing real users uh, using the system, you realize you need to make some adjustments. Like, how do you actually go back and make those adjustments without like basically blowing everything away and starting brand new? Um, yeah, so the answer to that would be you basically do. Uh, <laughs> you can take the, you can take the, the user's data and you can, um, yeah, I mean, like you, you basically would almost have to, uh, if you want to change the embedding space, you would basically have to say like, okay, well, we're going to retrain the embeddings model here. We have new data that shows that our initial, uh, hypotheses was incorrect and here's our new data and here's how it's actually going to work. And now we're going to have to re-embed everything. Um, so you really don't want to have to go through that process. You want to be right about how users are going to interact with your rag app. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then the metadata portion, uh, can you explain what exactly the metadata is? Is that just the text that's associated with the embedding? Is that what it's for? The metadata can be anything you want. So it can be the text. Uh, you can also add maybe the author of the text, the publication that the text is from, uh, which paragraph it is, the section header, uh, the date that it was published, um, all of these like different, uh, you know, uh, 
attributes you can add as metadata. Okay. And then how do you actually measure performance and what are the strategies for improving performance? Because essentially, you know, inference is already like an expensive uh, um, process for, and, and it's like one of the hard parts, especially with the open source models, whether you have enough like hardware to, to answer the question in, in a reasonable amount of time for whatever the application is. But now you're adding an additional step as well, where you're doing the search of a, a vector database and pulling back that uh, con- additional context to add into the prompt. Yeah. Uh, so we have, uh, so A, you can run Milvis like on your own and, and kind of like see how that is. But in terms of optimization, what you want to look for is you want to look for usage. Um, and we have some built in optimization that will kind of like do this for you. So, for example, ooh, I don't know, if this is in 2.3, this might be in 2.4. Uh, we have auto scaling. Uh, so that it will like detect like how you know how your usage is and you know if you need to spin up more um, nodes. So Milvis has this concept of nodes. Um, so there are three different, I guess, areas of concern when you're doing a search, and that would be the query. So how do you actually you know actually retrieving your data, uh, the data ingestion part, getting the data into the database, and then the indexing piece, which is creating the way that you uh, retrieve your data. And so based on, you know, what it is that you're doing, you can scale these different nodes up, uh, up and down. And then um, the other thing uh, is uh, storage optimization, right? So Milvis stores data in 512 megabyte segments. Um, you can change the segment size, but by default, we have 512 megabytes. And we also index over these segments. So what happens when you delete? So when you start deleting data, the segments start losing size. And that means that the indexes start losing efficiency. And so at a certain point, when the segments have reduced to a certain size, uh, Milvis will also do a, a cleanup where it will take segments and combine them again and re-index them again to, uh, to, to, to be more efficient, basically. Um, and then the way that we kind of get around having to do things like re-indexing if you add a lot of data which is a big problem if you uh, are using like a, a, a mono index, basically, um, is that we store these data in these segments, right? So like the, because we build index over these smaller segments, we don't have to worry about re-indexing as we add more data into Milvis. So in the context of RAG, like, do you think it's here to stay or are there other strategies that are coming out of like industry or research that are likely to replace the RAG model? I don't think anything's going to replace RAG in the upcoming let's say, oh, three to five years. Um, RAG will definitely continue to evolve. For example, last year, we saw a ton of people building text RAG. Everybody's building RAG on text. Next step, we're going to be building multimodal RAG. And then soon, we're going to be building, you know, uh, maybe auto RAG. I don't know, like, you know, these different things that will kind of, like, build around RAG. It's kind of like... uh, you know, like chatbots, right? Like in 20, 2010 or whatever, 2012, 2013, like these chatbots became popular on websites and they've been there ever since. And RAG is basically like, oh, guess what? We're going to replace these chatbots now. Uh, that's like the primary use that I've seen for RAG. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the kind of like baseline use case for LLMs and for RAGs is like is chatbots, but... At some point, we're gonna evolve beyond the the chatbot. Like that's kind of like the the hello world version of what you can do with generative AI, essentially. Yes, it has to. And then, in terms of the vector database, is this something that, like, if I'm using the vector database, and when it comes to thinking through like the indexing options, like how things are configured, is this something that I'm basically responsible for, like setting up and and sort of like twiddling these things and trying to optimize for my particular use case? Or are a lot of this stuff like figured out basically by the service for whatever is going to, you know, for the most part, like serve my needs? So Zillis will do the auto indexing and like whatever for you. Um, Milvis will not. Milvis says, hey, you're using this open source software. You must know what you're doing. So you should set this up as it would uh, work according to your needs. Um, and the reason it kind of also does this is because it is very likely that your needs are going to be different from 
most other users or, you know, from at least many other users. Um, so Milvis has this kind of approach of offering flexibility, right? Milvis is open source uh, and it is a general use unstructured data platform. And so that's why we want to cater to many use cases and offer this kind of flexibility and tailoring the way that you want to um, build your indexes uh, and do your searches. We even have the ability to tune your consistency for uh, your and uh, for your collection, your individual collections in Milvis, and for when you search, um, right? Because when you uh, when you're doing um, when you're working with a distributed system, so Milvis is a distributed uh, database. When you're working with a distributed system, you're going to have replicas and different instances and things like that. Um, and so we can even have your search and your write, your read and your write uh, data consistency be different. Yeah. So we haven't really sort of broken down like Milvis versus Zillas. Like, is Milvis Milvis is the open source project, and then Zillas is that essentially the managed service for Milvis? That's correct. Yes, Milvis is the open source project. Zillas is basically managed Milvis with some pizzazz on it. Um, so, uh, for example, there, it automates a lot of things. Uh, we've added this thing called, Z uh, Zill's cloud pipelines recently, where, uh, essentially we do the embeddings for you. Uh, we are using an open source model. You can click through and see which one. Um, and then, uh, what else does Zill's have? Zill's has some like, uh, other like hardware optimizations. So our cloud team, um, also has like a, a pretty strong hardware background, so they we, we did like the NVIDIA Raft GPU integration. So there's like, you know, this kind of hardware accelerated kind of uh, stuff on there. Um, Zill's Cloud is usually like a version behind uh, the Milvis release uh, just for stability reasons um, by a couple weeks and then uh, usually it catches up. So um, yeah, that's kind of the difference between Milvis and Zillis. Otherwise, they interact pretty much the same. Uh, you can you essentially have a host and a port when you are hosting Milvis locally, uh, and if you want, you can actually you know make that into a, a URI. Uh, and then with Zillis, you have a URI, which is the host and the port, and a token uh, to access the, the the server. And what's the history of Milvis? Like, when did that project start? Does that predate the um, 2017 uh, start of Zillis? No, it doesn't. So this is an interesting piece about Zillis because many open source companies do have that, right? Many open source companies, the open source project predates the forming of the company. So Zillis started in 2017 and Milvis was created in 2018. Um, and Milvis was open source in 2019 and then officially added to the Linux uh, AI Foundation, uh, donated to the Linux AI Foundation in 2020. Um, and then in 2022, we released Milvis 2. Um, so the idea behind Milvis, so uh, Charles was a, Charles is the CEO founder. Uh, he was um, at Oracle Cloud. So he was building, um, you know, databases. He's been building databases. So he knows about data, right? And so he wanted to go build uh, his, his own company. And he was like, well, I'm going to build something that I think is going to be, um, really important over the next, you know, 10, 20 years uh, that isn't a classical database. And so he was like, I think this vector data kind of stuff is going to be important. Um, and so this was like back in like 2016 or something like that. And so he left Oracle and he was like, well, I'm building this thing. And um, so he, he went back to China to go do this, uh, partially because of um, data privacy laws are much more permissive uh, in China than they are here. Um, so you can get a lot more data to do, to essentially test out your scale. He was like, okay, so one thing I think is going to be really important with this vector data is that, uh, it's going to be operating at large scale. So let's go prove that. And so basically that's, uh, that's how Milvis worked. And, uh, in 2021, we had a customer come to us and basically be like, Hey, we have 5 trillion vectors and, uh, yeah. And so we were like, oh, okay. Um, well, we can do like five billion right now. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, you know. Let's see how we move to five trillion. How, I mean, how did you guys? Do, how did you do that? How did you go from five billion to five trillion? Like, what are the the scale challenges? Or we can't support five. We can't support five trillion yet. There's this is like a. There's just we just it is at some point like you know your systems get too big right, um, but the the challenge for 
in moving into the billion category, the reason why we shifted uh, Milvis from Milvis 1 to Milvis 2 is that Milvis 1 uh, was built... Uh, so Milvis 2 is built as a distributed system, and it's built this way because of the scale problem. Because if you were built as a single instance uh, server, uh, you know, then you're going to run into hardware limitations. And so we saw that this would be an issue. And so we're like, oh, well, then you know, the only answer is to scale horizontally. Um, and so that's why uh, Milvis 2 is built that way. And that's kind of how we get around that uh, scaling into the billions issue. Um, yeah. So how, how does the distributed system work and what you know, new problems does that introduce? Yeah, so um, you can basically turn other things, you can build your own distributed system of, of, the, of other vector databases as well, if you would like. Uh, the challenge there is one of the big challenges would be this data consistency challenge, right? So you have these instances, you have these replicas, how consistent does your data need to be? And it, it will depend on your use case. Um, and the way we handle that is we have these shards and we have like hashes on your data that tells it like what shard is gonna write it and where it's gonna write it to and things like that. So, you know, you gotta come up with these systems of like how to do that. And then we have four levels of consistency. So we have uh, strong consistency, which basically says like, hey, like we gotta make sure all the writes are done before we do any reads. Uh, and then we have um, bounded consistency, which says like, after a certain amount of time, all reads are uh, propagated to all replicas. Uh, all writes are propagated to all replicas. Um, and then we have um, session consistency, which is just saying like, in this instance, in this connection, uh, all writes come, a all reads come after writes. And then there's eventual consistency, which just says, yeah, it'll get done eventually. <laughs> For people who are building, like using Milvis for, for uh, you know, RAG models, uh, presumably those are, are mostly like heavy read operations. Like uh, how much are they really inserting? I mean, you mentioned the drug discovery use case, which was not a RAG use case, but there they're doing a lot of heavy insertion. It's an only search, you know, a handful of times a year. But I would think that for most people, it's not the, the bulk of essentially the operations against the database are, are search. Yeah. Um, so it, you're, you're right. I think for RAG, it's mostly people doing read, which is part of the reason why Milvis has like this separation of, um, you know, these query nodes, data nodes and index nodes. And so, you know, if you're doing a lot of read, we'll just spin up a bunch of query nodes. Whereas if you're doing a lot of writes, you need to spin up a bunch of data nodes. Is it, is this the, 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 the fact that this works, uh, you know, sort of built, around being a distributed system. Is that sort of the unique sauce of, of Milvis or are there other things that make it unique from other vector databases that are out there? Yeah, so that's uh, one of the unique pieces of Milvis, right? Milvis is, um, as far as I know, the only distributed system uh, vector database. Um, and other things that make it unique uh, are like, for example, the segments, right? So. Um, why what we do with that is we um at search time you can have much much faster much more efficient search by essentially performing something that is a near constant time operation like searching this a particular segment is going to remain the same uh cost no matter how many uh parallel searches you run on that uh up to a certain number of course um and uh, just doing that and then adding like an extra aggregation on it. So that's how we do search and that's how we're able to do like very fast, um, like millisecond level vector search across a large amount of data. Um, another thing that is really interesting, at least to me, I think is really interesting about the way that Milvis works uh, and also is um, makes it more effective and more efficient at scale is the way the filtering works. So you can filter on your metadata. You can say, I only want to find things that are, I don't know, like text that starts with the word the, or that uh, is longer than 500 characters, or, you know, is date is published after today, or after, not after today, before, uh, before, before yesterday, something like that. Um, you can do this filtering, and the way that it works is it, Milvis goes, and it goes through all of the data and it looks at that attribute and it basically assigns, basically creates a bit mask that goes like, you know, if the attribute matches what you're looking for, then it gets a one, otherwise it gets a zero. 
And so when you uh, do this kind of pre-filtering, this gives you a linear time addition. Um, but it also means that the amount of data that you actually have to search becomes a lot smaller if you're doing something that filters for that filters through a high amount of data. Um, so these are kind of like some of the pieces that make Milvis uh, unique. The way that we filter the data, uh, the way that we do the uh, data segmentation for search, and uh, the distributed system with the um, separation of concerns. And then what are some of the like big technical challenges that need to be solved? Is it really just like the scale? Like, how do we get the five trillion? And also, like, how many businesses really have five trillion? I mean, I, I know you mentioned the one, but like, how common is that? Um, I would say that I would be unsurprised if many Fortune 500 companies had like less than a trillion vectors that they could use. Not that they are using, but they like could use if they wanted to. Um, mainly because there's just so much data that's sitting around unused. And there's probably more data sitting around unused than we're actually using. Um, at least that's what everybody predicts. So, Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I actually talked, I was in an event back in, in November, I think. Um, it was a, a data event. And I talked to the CDO of a public company and one of, and he was fairly new at this company. And one of the things he mentioned was that he was trying to solve was they're sitting on like a mountain of essentially unstructured data that's like encrypted in an S3 bucket. And they want to do something with that, but they have no way of essentially like unlocking the power of that data. Yep. Yep. So that there's there's a lot of data and uh, scale is definitely going to be one of the big problems. I don't think it's going to be the only problem. Um, I'm sure that uh, there's going to be some other hardware type limitations. I think like um, I actually think this is something that kind of applies to foundation models like, you know, uh, AI in general is just uh, there's going to be some compute limit. Um and I think it is. I think it's actually going to be hardware restricted. At least it seems like that. It seems that way at the moment. Um, so I think that there's that. That's going to be an issue. And then actually, I think uh, in terms of like really uh, implementing and using the data, not just like the technology, but like actually like using the data. It's like uh, education, right? Like people have to know. Like, okay, you have this data. How can you use it? If you don't know how to use it, then you're not going to. Yeah, it was kind of it, that goes back to you know some of the things we were saying earlier, where uh, the concept of a vector database is still very new. Like lots yeah. of people don't know what that is, so they might not even be aware of hey, there, there's actually this like technology that I can use to help me solve some of these problems that I don't have a solution to, to right now. Yeah, it's the new category problem essentially. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, as we start to kind of wrap things up, I have some quick fire questions for you. So uh, don't 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 uh, spend too much time thinking about these. Just think, first thing pops into your mind. You ready? All right. I love these things. All right. So if you could master one skill you don't have right now, what would it be? I thought I was going to really love this one, but I didn't have this one in mind at all. Uh, sales. Sales. <laughs> what wastes the most time in your day? Scrolling social media. If you could invest in one company that's not the company you work for, who would it be? Me hugging face. Hugging face. All right. Uh, and now, actually, uh, Google's a big investor in Hugging Face uh, at this point. Uh, it was recently announced. What tool or technology can you not live without? Python. What person influenced you the most in your career? Matthew McConaughey. Uh, I got to dig into that. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I watched a graduation speech that he gave. And one of the things that he talks about in the speech is at some point when he was younger, when he was um, like 15 or something, uh, someone who was important to him came to him in his life and was like, uh, who's your hero? And so he was like, well, it's me 10 years from now. And so 10 years later, he sees this person again. And uh, she goes up and she says, well, are you a hero now? And he says, um, no, because my hero now is me 10 years from now. And uh, the idea that he kind of like, uh, you know, pr proposes behind this is that your hero should always be someone who is ahead of you that you can't catch. And for me, the way that this has translated into not just my career, but my life in general is like, uh, it's given me this kind of like mindset of, you know, how do I get better at the things that I'm not good at? And how do I define like, what are the things that I want to get better at? Uh, and so this has also been uh, incredibly helpful for me in my career because it lets me notice like things like, oh, like here's something that I can tell that someone's doing a lot better than I am. How do I incorporate that into 
my image of how I'm going to be better at this. Awesome. All right. Last question. What's your probability that AI equals a doom for the human race? Uh, ooh, doom for the human race. I would say zero. Um, it depends on what you mean by doom. I am a big proponent of the singularity. I think it would be really interesting. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else you'd like to share? Anything else I'd like to share? Um, for the audience, if you're interested in doing hackathons and you're in Seattle, hit me up. <laughs> and how, how can people uh, learn more and how can they follow you? Oh, uh, yes. So you can find me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm the most active. I'm pretty much responsive on there all the time. Y-U-J-I-A-N-T-A-N-G. Awesome. Eugene, thanks so much for being here. I really enjoyed this and hopefully we'll have you back down the road. Yeah. Great, uh, great to be on here. It was an awesome chat, Sean. All right. Cheers.